Hey guys, guess who's visiting us today? Why, wow, Zinan Dai Fluoride! And wait, who's that? Another Teflon container of Zinan Dai Fluoride. Looks like this video is going to be full of reactions with it, right? Well, not really. I used almost one whole jar just testing it out, and I may have spilled a little bit too. And part of second jar went into making some cool photos for my upcoming chemistry reaction book. It should be out soon, so stay tuned for updates on this channel. And with what I have left, I filmed a few reactions for this video. Still, this is by far the most expensive video I've ever made for this channel. So let's jump in and don't forget to leave your comments. So guys, xenon difluoride is a very expensive chemical, and since I needed a decent amount of it, I was looking for the best deal on the market, and it turned out to be some Chinese company. They sent me this reagent, packed in a foil vacuum bag like this. And by the way, if anyone's curious, I translated these Chinese characters, and they mean just xenon difluoride in Chinese. Let's open this package and take out the Teflon container with the xenon difluoride. Let's unscrew the lid of this Teflon jar and check out the xenon difluoride. These white crystals film in the air and have a pretty nasty smell, kind of like chlorine bleach and sewage. If we put this substance in a test tube and start heating it, instead of melting, it will sublimate, depositing on the cold walls of a test tube. To give you a close-up look at these beautiful crystals, I used a special ultra-macro lens. Up close, you can really see the dendritic, snowflake-like patterns of the xenon difluoride. The branches form because the vapor deposits unevenly. If you open the Wikipedia article on xenon difluoride in this photo next to the crystals, you'll see a weird, cloudy streak. I think this photo was taken on glass, because when my sample of this substance sat on glass for a while, the exact same streak appeared on its surface. Now let's move on and take a look at how this stuff reacts with chemical elements. For the first reaction I took some tungsten powder. By itself this element is quite inert, but what happens when it comes into contact with xenon difluoride? Let's find out. For this I pour a bit of tungsten powder into a test tube and then add some xenon difluoride powder on top. Incredible, it took just 5 seconds for these two solids to start reacting. Notice that after the reaction nothing is left in the test tube. This clearly indicates that volatile tungsten hexafluoride was formed as a result of the reaction. Since it's a gas at room temperature, it's no wonder there is nothing left in the test tube, the whole reaction product just evaporated. By the way, I've got a few videos on my channel about tungsten hexafluoride, be sure to check them out if you haven't seen them yet. The reaction with tungsten just on contact, without any extra conditions, surprised me a bit, so I decided to see if this substance would react with tungsten trioxide. This powder is very stable, it hardly dissolves in any acid except hydrofluoric acid. But let's see what happens when it reacts with xenon difluoride. After adding xenon difluoride, as I expected, nothing happened, so I decided to store the two components with a glass rod. Wow, just look, it seems some kind of reaction has started with a tungsten trioxide too. This is really amazing, such an inert powder reacted so easily just at room temperature. And it seems like tungsten hexafluoride formed in this reaction too. 
to prove the formation of tungsten hexafluoride, I took a two-neck flask and added tungsten trioxide to it. Then I added the xenon difluoride, just like in the previous reaction. After that, I stirred the components a bit. I sealed the flask with a stopper that had a gas outlet tube and ran a flow of argon through it. The idea of the reaction is that the argon flow will carry the tungsten hexafluoride formed in the reaction alone into a test tube containing a solution of tin dichloride. If the solution of a test tube turned blue, it means that tungsten hexafluoride is definitely being formed in this reaction, as you can see the tin dichloride solution turned blue. That means tungsten blue has formed. Tungsten blue is the name for a group of deeply blue tungsten compounds that appear when hexavalent tungsten compounds are partially reduced. Now let's try an experiment with xenon difluoride and an element even more inert than tungsten – tantalum. I put both powders into a test tube, and when nothing happened right away, I gave them a stir. Check out that column of sparks that shot up from this reaction. By the way, this is one of the reactions I've included in my upcoming book on chemical reactions. Make sure you stay subscribed, so you don't miss when the book is released. I got really curious. Could xenon difluoride fluorinate vanadium into vanadium pentafluoride? Just like in the early experiments, I mixed uh, the two powders in a test tube and watched uh, what would happen. Yes, almost immediately we noticed yellow fumes and an orange coating on the wall of a test tube. This is very similar to the formation of vanadium pentafluoride, a liquid at room temperature that instantly forms vanadium pentoxide upon contact with moisture in the air. Vanadium pentoxide is orange, just like the layer we see on the side of a test tube. Now let's check how xenon difluoride reacts with more active metals. For this experiment, I took some sodium and added xenon difluoride on top. No reaction occurred, so I decided to give it a little help by using a glass rod to get the xenon difluoride to react with the sodium. Interestingly, even then nothing happened, so I decided to try a more reactive sodium-potassium alloy, which is liquid at room temperature. At first there was no reaction either, and only when I started storing with a glass rod did the reaction occur. So, the liquid sodium-potassium alloy performed well in this reaction, but what about liquid mercury? Nothing happens at first, and even after a while, when these two substances touch. Maybe I should try mixing them. Even after stirring, nothing happened. It seems there is only one way left to make them react – heating. So, I started heating the test tube, but the reaction still didn't occur, however vapors of sublimating xenon difluoride appeared, along with small crystals settling on the cooler part of the test tube. And just when I was about to stop heating, the reaction finally happened. The white deposit on the test tube could very well be mercury fluoride, but the brown color is characteristic of mercury oxide. What do you think? Write your thoughts in the comments. The next element I chose to react with xenon difluoride was thulium. By the way, it's the rarest of all the lanthanides, aside from radioactive promethium. I chose a thulium because it produces bright green sparks when it burns. And now we'll see if they appear in this reaction. It's pretty strange. Thulium powder is much more reactive than tungsten or tantalum. But nothing happened immediately, so I had to heat the test tube to start the reaction. Yeah, it was an extremely bright and violent reaction. I honestly didn't expect the test tube to break. Green sparks can be obtained in a calmer reaction using elemental amorphous boron.
That was a Morphous Boron. But what about Crystalline Boron? This form of Boron is very inert toward many aggressive substances, but will it be able to withstand Xenon Difluoride? It was logical that no reaction would happen at first, so I heated the test tube to try to get the reaction started. Even an inert substance like crystalline boron could not withstand the reactivity of xenon difluoride. Interestingly, copper powder turned out to be the most resistant to xenon difluoride. Even after prolonged heating of the mixture, all the xenon difluoride sublimated and no reaction occurred. The reaction with cobalt powder also looked unpromising at first, but in the end, after prolonged heating, it did occur. Judging by the color of the products, you can see cobalt trifluoride and a little pink cobalt difluoride. Xenon difluoride dissolves in water, forming an unstable solution with strong oxidizing properties, which gradually hydrolyzes into xenon, hydrogen fluoride, and oxygen. I found an interesting mention that methane, when passed through an aqueous solution of xenon difluoride, is oxidized to carbon dioxide, albeit with a low yield. So I decided to test this claim. I dissolved xenon difluoride in water, filled a balloon with methane from a gas cylinder, and started passing the methane through the xenon difluoride solution. The resulting gas mixture I directed into a barium hydroxide solution, which will clearly indicate the presence of carbon dioxide in the mixture. To better show the white barium carbonate forming, I placed a black background behind it. After some time the flask became cloudy, a clear sign that carbon dioxide had formed. But it's possible that this is barium fluoride precipitate, which is poorly soluble in water too. After all, it could be that the hydrogen fluoride formed during the hydrolysis of xenon difluoride reacted with the barium hydroxide. To test this idea, I repeated the previous experiment, but this time I used the inner gas, argon. After all the argon was used, the barium hydroxide solution stayed clear, so the earlier reaction with methane and xenon difluoride really did occur. Xenon difluoride dissolved in water can oxidize iodide and bromide ions either in solution or in solid salts to elemental iodine and bromine. This is a reaction with potassium iodide. And this one is with potassium bromide, both in solution and as a solid. Solid xenon difluoride immediately releases chlorine gas from hydrochloric acid. I also tested if adding xenon difluoride to an acidified manganese sulfate solution would produce permanganate ions. But after I mixed the two solutions and gently heated them, only a brown precipitate of manganese dioxide was formed. Although it's possible that a mixture of ions forms here. In any case, I did several of these experiments and never managed to get the purple color characteristic of permanganate ions. Just a few drops of xenon difluoride solution were enough to decolorize organic dyes, such as litmus, indigo, and brilliant green. If we dissolve xenon difluoride in fluorosulfuric acid, one of the main products of this reaction will be peroxidisulfuryl difluoride, or more simply, the peroxide of fluorosulfuric acid. Xenon difluoride reacts with fluorosulfuric acid quite vigorously, and the gas released in the process that we observe is xenon. The peroxidisulfuryl difluoride formed as a result of the reaction readily oxidizes sulfur, leading to the formation of a blue-colored sulfur complex cation. 
And by the way, if xenon difluoride is added to ordinary sulfur, nothing happens, even with stirring. The reaction occurs only when the mixture is heated. It seems that this reaction produces not the higher hexafluoride, but sulfur tetrafluoride, because white films of hydrogen fluoride are clearly visible, which form when sulfur tetrafluoride comes into contact with moisture in the air. After the experiment, the test tube has a characteristic frosted appearance. Germanium, which is usually much less reactive than sulfur, on the contrary began to ignite upon contact with xenon difluoride. And here is the reaction of xenon difluoride with white phosphorus. And of course, I couldn't overlook the reaction with anhydrous hydrazine. Compared to the reaction with anhydrous perchloric acid, this reaction turned out to be surprisingly very calm. Thanks for watching, guys! I'm very glad that I managed to make a video with reactions of yet another substance that many people are interested in. This video wouldn't have been possible without my patrons. It's thanks to them that I'm able to delight my viewers with new videos as often as possible. If you have the opportunity, be sure to join them. See you in the next video, and it will be very soon.